Mihi mahana o te ahi ahi ki a koutou. Um, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that it's really easy for us to mock futures uh, that have come up in the past. And I thought I might lead with that because there's quite a lot of research that shows that the more people know about a topic, the worse they are at predicting the future of that topic. And interestingly, the CIA in the US, which is one of the biggest government investors in futures, now has a panel of what they call super Thank forecasters you. of people who work alongside them who are amateurs. And quite frequently, the amateurs beat the professionals at being able to predict uh, particularly the timing of specific things, so the length of the pandemic, for example, the day that war might break out in Ukraine, and so on. And one of the things I'd like you to take away from my talk is that there really are no future facts, that we have enough trouble, as you can hear from some of the, the great speeches we had this morning, the way we see the past is not the same depending on our point of view of the past. And the same happens in the future. We don't have the same point of view about what the future will be, and interestingly, what, what Futures uh, research has shown over the last probably 20 years now is that one of the best things we can do is to think about scenarios and think about different ways that the future might turn out. And so as a futurist, I spend my time playing in these kind of four segments. Uh, at the top are megatrends, which are also the things we might call drivers of change, and I'm going to dig into a few of those today. Um, I'm not so interested in the wild cards. They're the things that we know exist. They're like the jokers in the pack that you throw down. We know they're out there. They're going to turn up. Uh, they may not be on a regular cycle. Then I'm quite interested in this bottom segment as well, which are weak signals. And so weak signals are the things that are like, to me, they're like little messages, kind of almost like Hansel and Gretel kind of breadcrumbs from the future where if we're paying attention, what we can do is that we can see that patterns start to emerge long before people around us realise. Um, I'll give you a great example of a weak signal, which is that uh, this really ages me, but in 1979, I learned to code. I was at an all-girls high school in rural New Zealand, and the only way that I could learn coding was to be bused to the local boys' school because it wasn't a girls' subject. And uh, while I was bused to the local boys' school, they didn't actually own a computer. We had to make punch cards. We mailed them to Wellington, and two weeks later, our cards would come back, and we'd find out whether our code worked. There was no guidance counsellor who thought that it looked like a good idea to carry on with coding. Um, and I don't know if anyone from my class carried on with it. I certainly didn't take it in my first year at university. And the main reason I didn't take it in my first year at university is that we got to go on a field trip to Wellington. And so we caught this, this bus to Wellington and we went to the Ministry of Transport. So huge apologies to anyone who might still be there. Um, but in those days, it had these long linoleum corridors. It had men in walk shorts smoking in their offices. And the only other woman I saw on the trip uh, was pushing the tea trolley. And she whacked me with a wooden spoon as a starving teenager when I took both a crispy and a ginger nut. And you were allowed one or the other. Um, and um, we got this pitch from the Ministry of Transport that if I did a, a three-year degree in computer science, I too could come to Wellington and program traffic lights. And at that point, I realised that computer science was not for me. And thankfully, I, I did make some changes later on in my career and found myself back in tech. But there were weak signals there, like early schools that were starting to teach coding or coming and thinking about what early applications of computers might be. Uh, if we hadn't had all of that work at places like Ministry of Transport or the early Whanganui computer and so on, we wouldn't actually be sitting here doing this call today. So these weak signals start to add up over time. And what we know is that anything that becomes mainstream, it sort of bounces along the bottom, like slowly, 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 suddenly. And, um, and so I'm, I'm quite interested in these weak signals. And then the trends area, I'm not so interested in either. These are the things that um, are already in the market. They're already common. If any of you have had COVID this year, which unfortunately I had, I stayed at home. I watched uh, terrible television. And one of the things that struck me was just how many home decorating shows there now are on TV. They're perfect for napping in uh, when you're not feeling well. 
but that's a global phenomenon that when people have been stuck in their houses for a couple of years, they, they spend a lot of time uh, redecorating if they can. So I'm going to talk today mostly about these megatrends and these weak signals. So a couple of the megatrends or the drivers of change that I'm spending a lot of time thinking about are these ones. This, what is it to become bicultural? How is the climate crisis affecting us? This idea of software eating the world. Um, food at scale and the gig economy. I'm just going to go through these very quickly and then I'm going to move on to the implications for regulation. So one of the big things, um, we've had a number of talks today, so kia ora Bill and Lil, um, around um, the changing dynamics in New Zealand. But this diagram for me is a, a particularly useful one, particularly because I, I love the math. And what you can see on the right-hand side is the non-Māori population, and it has what I call a bit of like middle-age spread. Um, I'm right in that median of what does a Pākehā New Zealander look like. Uh, we're very slightly more uh, female. We've got a median age of 54. I'm a little bit older than that. Um, and you can see that we haven't really been popping out lots of babies. Um, on the other side, what you see is that sort of perfect triangle. When I first did my course, first course in demography, that was sort of what we got taught, was that you had small numbers of old people and a lot of young people. And this is the um, what the Māori population looks like. And the Māori median age is in its late 20s and will hit 34 in about another 10 years' time. So what we can see is we have two very different populations in New Zealand. And the pandemic played this out as well. So New Zealand was one of the few countries for the first two years of the pandemic where our life expectancy increased. We had negative excess deaths. This is true at the population level, but it's not true for Māori. So for Māori, Māori life expectancy continued to decline right through the pandemic. And we had a disproportionate number of Māori who have both died from COVID and will be suffering from long COVID. Um, something that you don't see if you only look at the, the macro uh, level of New Zealand. It also means when we think about future workforce, um, you can see that there's not that much of that future workforce being produced um, by the Pākehā population and Māori population is producing where a lot of that workforce will come from in the future. So we also we've had a number of conversations about climate. Um, we also know that climate change is really biting now. Uh, I was reading a report this morning about Qatar, which has already had 1.8 degree change in temperature. So when we talk about um, a 1.5 or a 2.5 across the planet, that's an average. And there are places in the world that are already um, edging towards what is um, kind of towards the end of, of where humans can survive. And if we think about pandemics for a minute, uh, I worked for the Ministry for the Environment in 1990 and I wrote a report while I was there saying that this was the year that Nelson would be underwater and that we would be hit by a dengue fever pandemic um, thanks to the changes that we were making to our climate. Now, it turned out I was wrong about which pandemic, um, but we certainly are seeing exactly what has been predicted and interestingly, 1850 was the first uh, published research on climate change. And by the 1890s, the climate science was fairly well settled that if we took carbon out of the ground and put it into the air, that we would be having this kind of impact. And so I often think, you know, we, we assume that this climate message is recent. It's taken us a very long time as human beings. And if I look back at my own whānau, um, that is five generations of my family um, since scientists have been publishing work that said that climate change was going to impact Papa Tuanuku and us. Um, what we can also see from a climate point of view, I took a, a course in climate medicine at university in the States in 1989, and there what we saw is that the expansion of animal agriculture was the thing that would turn this century into pandemic century. And so, you know, we might all be hoping that we're post-pandemic but a number of us in, in my work think that this was the practice run, not the one. And so we want to be thinking about how do we learn from that, what do we do to prevent future pandemics, and so on. Um, this idea of software taking over the world has been around for a long time. I think the big change that we've really seen in the last 10 years is that um, more and more software is now embedded in hardware. So this is a fridge that you can buy at Noel Leeming's, don't have it, not an ad, not a shareholder. 
Um, but if you bought it overseas, it's integrated with an Amazon shopping cart. Um, the fridge scans the barcode of the food that comes in. It scans the food as it goes out. And if you don't put it back in for a third pass, it drops it into your Amazon shopping cart. This is the next place in terms of the next bit of real estate that advertisers are going to be fighting for. Um, advertising generally isn't working. It's not working on online TV. It's not really working in the web. Um, but if I can get you to buy a coupon for my butter right in your kitchen, um, there will be a lot of people that are hoping that that's where we can start to do this. This fridge wouldn't exist without the Kindle and, um, and other hardware that we use that ha basically has buy now buttons on it. And so what we're, we're expecting to see is the end of websites. And if you can remember before a website, you can imagine a time post a website. And so increasingly in my field, uh, what we're seeing is hardware and that hardware might be a car, it might be a truck, it might be a Kindle, or it might be a fridge or a stove, uh, it might be your Fitbit, it might be your watch, but they're the things where people are increasingly moving to commerce. What's also very interesting is that right since mobile phones started doing commerce, women engage in mobile phone commerce almost, um, well more than men, 80% of mobile phone commerce is done by women. And the biggest area of women's growth in terms of technology and commerce is using voice. And so almost 60% of all voice uh, searches that are done are done by women. And so if you really want to see where the cutting edge of these technologies are, you generally look to uh, busy women who need to find solutions for themselves. And so that's where these kind of domestic items have been taking over from the web for quite some time. What we also see is um, producing food at scale is changing quite rapidly. And you've probably all been following some of the debate around Hiwaki Kanoa. I was the first independent director on beef and lamb in New Zealand. I am a director of a meat company. And um, what, what we can see is that these emergent technologies that are producing food are far more likely to change the dynamics of our uh, emissions profile than many of the other activities that we're undertaking in our food supply chains. And so for five years, I've been following the growth of precision fermentation breast milk. Uh, so there's a company at the top there, Turtle Tree Labs, and what they've been doing for five years now is that a very wealthy woman postpartum can come in, they take a sample of her breast tissue and give her back two years worth of formula designed by you know her uh, for her child as opposed to another company, Biomilk, um, who has looked at all of the women who are sort of super milk producers they can find and have made a uh, substrate that they can scale up and make um, breast milk basically out of carbohydrates. So you, you take the substrate from all of these women who are super milk makers, then you put sugar cane in and you get breast milk out. Uh, it's bioidentical to breast milk and you cannot tell any difference between it. And then on the left, what we see is a company called Helena, who I'm very interested in. Um, so while you look, if you're interested in where technology is going, you look at women. If you want to know where diet fads are going, you look at American bodybuilders. Uh, so they were, the, they were the origin of paleo, keto, and so on. They, they are the biggest consumers of breast milk products in the U.S. Um, and they do things like buy lactoferrin, so uh, breast milk-derived iron supplements, um, breast milk-derived cheese, and so on. None of that has come through a human. Um, it's that same idea that you take a substrate, you put it into a vat, you feed it lots of sugar cane, and breast milk or breast milk components come out. This is a huge challenge to the way that the dairy industry uh, needs to think about its future. There's been some very interesting cases this year in India. Uh, India is one of the few countries in the world where um, the sale of actual fresh breast milk has been legal. Um, there's just been a challenge to that and an injunction um, and the Olacta has been forced in October to take their products off the market. But some very deep ethical discussions about whether or not it's ethical to milk women, uh, pasteurize that milk, and to sell that milk. And so, you know, some of these debates around food, where the future of food is, um, we're often not thinking about it. We think about our New Zealand uh, agrarian based economy, pastoral based economy, but there are some headwinds coming at us from, from some of these technologies. We think about the plant based meat or alternative proteins.
Um, but in many ways, uh, where I'm more interested is in these challenges to the dairy sector, and particularly uh, within perhaps two years, it will be cheaper to make whey by putting plant material into a vat and taking out whey than it will be to put plant material into a cow and break the whey out from that. And so we start to see some real changes in the way that we think about food production. Similarly, what we're seeing is um, with this discussion about low emissions, discussion about organics, discussion about uh, water use, um, and the price of solar virtually becoming zero in many economies, we're seeing urban agriculture exploding. And in 2016, I went and saw a vertical farm in the States. The first generation of these vertical farms all went broke. And what we see now by 2022 is that there are very clear business models. So they have solar on the roof, which means they pay almost nothing for their power. They have water, and if they've done this well, they have water reuse systems where they're paying very little for their water. Um, they have amazing genetics, the ability to do 40 or 50 crops a year, which means that they can continue to titrate and get the right nutrients for that plant, get the right light, um, get the optimal growing conditions and get the right seed. And so we're seeing this massive acceleration at the moment in indoor agriculture, particularly started in, in lettuces and leafy greens, and then it's moved on to, uh, to other fruit, in particular berries. And these are able to be um, designed easily. You know, here you can see Oishi gets $50 a box for six uh, strawberries. That's $50 US, so real money. Um, and it's really changing the dynamic around the way that food is produced. Uh, plant food is doing some amazing work here in New Zealand, and we have a lot of incredible food scientists who are working on this. Um, but at the mainstream level, very few people uh, are talking about these big changes coming to agriculture. So the other one I want to talk about was the gig economy. And so we've seen a real change in terms of casualization of labor. Uh, the pandemic has accelerated this. On one hand, we can see the skills shortage that has occurred globally, and we're seeing wage inflation globally. On the other hand, we're all watching in the tech sector as we see First, earlier in the year, we saw 200,000 Ukrainian techs get taken off the tech market um, where they were big outsourcing projects and their um, wages for tech continued to grow. Now we're seeing the tech bubbles pop and we're seeing uh, more and more technology staff flood onto the market. But as they flood onto the market, they're also not willing to move. And so globally, we've seen a growth in regions uh, similar here in New Zealand where people are now able to work from wherever they want but security of work is not something that, uh, that we're seeing. We also see from Statistics New Zealand that that dynamics that I talked about with the demographics is that we're predicting that we'll see an increase in immigration from uh, China in particular and also from India um, to make up the workforce that is required in New Zealand. This has some big implications for social cohesion. It has some implications for how we think about treaty. What does that mean? Um, and then what we also just see here on the right is more and more businesses um, who don't need to own premises anymore. They can rent, uh, whether it's renting office space by the hour, renting kitchens by the hour in order to do Uber Eats. We've just seen this very big change. Um, it's been coming for about 10 years but it's well embedded that the gig economy is, is here to stay. So I want to just change gears very slightly um, because as we start to see some of these major um, drivers of change globally, what we are also starting to see is some real debate about what government is for and what the theory of change is. And so, you know, I, I think in New Zealand we're having these big discussions about becoming bicultural, I found it very interesting that Wales, the government of Wales, has produced a report about what it would be to be an anti-racist country. And so different, different debates based on the cultural background and the history of those countries. Um, we see that intergenerational poverty remains a big issue in New Zealand. Uh, the Helen Clark Foundation put out a report a couple of years ago showing it takes three generations in New Zealand to lift a family out of poverty. Um, obviously, climate change is on everyone's agenda, life expectancy, educational outcomes, social connectedness, quality housing at scale, 
And then we have these discussions emerging globally around regulatory stewardship. But this idea of what is government for is quite an important one before we can start to really think about um, about what regulation needs to look like in this future that we're heading into. And so one of the things I want to pick up on, and this comes from the UAE, who are not always a progressive country on everything, but are one of the three countries I think that are doing really good long-term thinking and futures thinking better than most others. And they've really said that they need to have government 50-year plans, that governments must have this long-term foresight and planning, and they must anticipate and solve for potential problems before they occur. And this is an area that, um, you know, obviously can't be done within election cycles. And uh, some places are having debates around extending the election cycle. But whether we had a three-year or a five-year election cycle doesn't really mean that we're taking these long-term views. And what we're seeing is quite a strong movement globally for futures and foresight work to be incorporated into government thinking and government design. So, um, and the big questions really are that as we think about regulatory regimes, um, as technological change comes, as these big business model changes come, you know, how do we actually think differently about, uh, about the regulation of them? As things become more and more borderless, um, what does that mean? So on one hand, what we're seeing at the moment is actually almost a slight collapse of globalisation, where we're seeing that globalisation is not expanding at the rate that it was. Uh, trade is changing quite markedly around the planet. But at the same time, these multinationals um, are still existing and still part of our daily lives. And most of the regulatory tools that we have around them were designed for the past and not for the future. And so when something like a Facebook emerges, um, what we tend to do is we think about privacy and we think about, um, about free speech. We, we don't really understand what the role of those um, big social media or others are in our lives. And then how do we think about regulating disruptive technologies? So if you look at something like the big, the big threats that are coming, in my opinion, to the dairy sector, um, often what happens is that people kind of point and laugh at them at the beginning, and then what happens is people try to regulate and sue them somehow. So the industry usually gets together and says, look, we need governments, whether it's the US government or the Canadian government or whoever, to regulate the word meat, or we need you to regulate the word milk. Um, so it's not being done for a consumer. Consumers know perfectly well that if they're buying plant-based meat or if they're buying almond milk, that they're very definitely making a choice not to buy meat or milk that's been produced in an animal. But the industries think that somehow they can stave off this uh, future threat by getting governments to regulate the word. And so there are a number of governments around the world that have regulated the word milk or the, uh, regulating the word meat. It is not going to make an iota of difference. It makes the farmers feel better. Um, but it actually doesn't change anything. It just means the consumers kind of roll their eyes a little. And so we see this, like, who are regulations for? What is it that they're trying to achieve? Are we using these regulations in order to try and uh, perpetuate the past, for example, or are we enabling innovation? And I think one of the biggest questions we have is this one about democracy and faith in government. Is it under threat? And if it is, how do we deal with that? So... I found this in my Twitter scheme this morning and um, stream this morning, and I just had to put it in because I think one of the big things that we've seen in terms of changes in the way that we think about the role of government is the interconnectedness of government, and New Zealand has done a very good job of starting to really think about what is a whole-of-government approach to things. So how do we think about public health at the same time as we think about transport? How do we think about um, social cohesion at the same time as we think about housing planning? Um, and so I found it very interesting here, this kind of pushback um, for, you know, we shouldn't be doing, somehow the NHS shouldn't be involved in, in keeping people's houses warm, whereas that is exactly where good thinking is going across the globe. So there was a mention of anticipatory regulation um, in the conversation, in the introduction, and we are seeing more and more of this work where how do we start to become a little more agile? How do we start to think about um, where regulation is going? How do we create these sandboxes? 
um, the growth in open data. So I chaired Lunds's Risk and Audit Committee for a number of years when open data sat with us and then later it went over to Statistics New Zealand. Um, and again, New Zealand has done quite a good job in some areas around open data and making that data useful and usable by policymakers uh, and by businesses. So there's still a very long way to go on that. And then there's this really, how do we get the interface between regulators and innovators and active engagement by the public um, in the design of the regulatory regimes? And increasingly we are seeing, and, and through a number of things like the LTIB process, um, community consultation and broader consultation. And I have to say, I think this is happening much better at the local government level than it is happening at the central government level. Um, and we are seeing a lot of this at the local government level across New Zealand. But this real way of thinking, it needs to be outcomes-based, it needs to be future-facing, it needs to be proactive. And you know what? We're not always going to get it right along the way, but it needs to have a much faster clock speed than we currently have with many of the regulatory regimes that we operate. So let me give you an example from Singapore. Um, in 2016, they created this Committee on the Future Economy. Um, they picked a number of areas where they were willing to allow um, open up regulatory regimes and say, we will make these regulations up as we go, basically. So they have the Autonomous Vehicle Initiative, which has allowed them to really release uh, autonomous vehicles in the wild and to regulate as they go and as they learn with the industry. Um, they've done similar things with their smart financial centres and with the Energy Market Authority. You know, we've we've had a um, very strong role here where the theory of government has been to keep the cost down in our energy markets. And if we're keeping the cost down, that has been at the expense of innovation and of decarbonising our energy industry in New Zealand. And so how could we perhaps think about encouraging decarbonisation and innovation through using different tools? And then the final one I'm going to mention is this precision fermentation for food security. So uh, Singapore has ended up with a centre of excellence in precision fermentation of food, and it's largely because they have a food security plan there is very little land available to them in Singapore. And so um, the production of protein is not easy for them, which means that they're dependent on protein coming across the border from other countries. And so what they've wanted to do is invest heavily in these technologies that convert carbohydrate to protein, and they allow them to be sold in their markets. And so they have developed a very strong innovation in this area. Um, we also see this growth of agile regulation around the world where we might be able to build half a house and build the other half later without having to come back and do a second permitting process. Um, and we can really think about outcome-based regulation. But I wanna just think about the narratives that are in here. So in the 1980s um, and, and beyond, we really had a big discussion about market failure being the reason that we needed uh, regulation. And then there's been this sort of move to guardianship being the language globally of regulation. Um, and then we've seen this idea of somehow we've sort of got to manage these big digital monopolies, the Amazons, the, the Twitters, the um, TikToks and so on. Um, and, and, and we still don't really know how to get our hands around them. And part of it to me is that we don't have a clear narrative about what it is that we're trying to do. And so what if we really thought like the Singaporeans about um, do we want to impede or enable um, including innovation and what might that look like? And so I want to just quickly talk about Wales. Wales was the first country in the world um, to put the SDGs into legislation. I had the privilege of spending a couple of days with Sophie Howe just recently, who is the um, Commissioner for Future Generations in Wales. Um, they produced a manifesto for the future in 2020. They went out and they had a conversation with Welsh citizens. Um, over 5,000 uh, people were involved in online and then they had um, several thousand people involved in workshops. And out of that, they came up with these seven areas um, that they wanted uh, you know, for the future of Wales. And interestingly, when they came back and asked what was the most critical issue facing Wales back in 2015, it was climate change. And so Sophie Howe as commissioner 
has really taken up that challenge. And there was an interesting uh, situation recently where, um, as a commission, they managed to stop the development of new roads uh, in Wales because it clearly wasn't meeting the health and um, and climate change outcomes that the, that the whole of government was requiring. And I think that this model of a, a commissioner for the future is a really good one. Um, the UAE, as I said, is not necessarily progressive in all areas, but they have built a ministry of possibilities. And this ministry is a virtual ministry. And again, I got to meet with one of their uh, senior leaders just recently. And I found it very interesting in terms of how they were really trying to achieve the impossible and thinking about how to um, bring the impossible into government. And I think that there's quite a lot that we can learn from what they're doing here. Um, and then finally, Finland um, has been really active since 1993. They have um, every government agency has a futures function in it. They have um, expertise. They have dialogues. The Prime Minister's office contains a foresight panel. And they have a cross-party committee of parliament with 17 members in it who produce a report every parliamentary term on the future of Finland and what is required. So kind of not like our BIM as a briefing to the incumbent minister created by the agency. Instead, what it is is that these 17 parliamentarians get together mm -hmm. and produce a cross-party report to the incoming uh, government on what are the big issues facing Finland. And um, what you then also have is the permanent secretaries, which are basically like our secretaries or our CEs of our government agencies, they also write a response. And so what they have is a very good cadence here of um, thinking about how to anticipate what are the big issues that Finland needs to deal with and then how should uh, parliament and government as a whole address those issues. So they have a, a much more cohesive approach to futuring and to using scenarios across all government agencies. So they've produced a whole range of reports and they also put together a fund uh, that helps from the outside and it has 40 to 50 million euros a year to invest in futures research, um, which then feeds into those government agencies and parliamentary processes. And they're very clear about the three core topics, which is around sustainability, a fair data economy and democracy and participation. And so they really put money into how do they create that vision. And I think there are a number of things we can learn from all three of those countries. Um, the UK, I spent some time with their foresight team just recently as well. Um, and, you know, they have been producing these reports now for over 20 years where the, they are putting out discussion papers for government and for the private sector to use on, on where they think the country is going. So there is no one future out there. I want to make that super clear. Um, this is some work that I did at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I produced this on February 7th, uh, 2019, and I was talking about weak signals. Um, in December of, of 2019, there was this respiratory illness that was outbreaking in China. I work a lot for the food industry, so I track novel zoonoses. New Zealand had been making money hand over fist for two years out of uh, African swine fever and pigs, which had meant that China was willing to import a lot more lamb than usual because they'd had to cull their pork. We've also had a couple of big pandemics around um, avian flu, which has been an opportunity for the New Zealand food sector. So we're constantly looking out for these opportunities and threats. And we, I saw this and I thought it was vaguely interesting and I put in my database and then one of the uh, doctors or the whistleblower doctors went to jail. And so at that point, um, I, I sat up and took a whole lot more notice. On the 23rd of January, that report that's on the right there um, was the first peer-reviewed report that was genomic analysis of the virus that showed that it had come from a bat to a pangolin to a human. And um, that was the point, 23rd of January 2020, um, that we knew that this had a food relationship, that it had really emerged out of animal agriculture and, uh, and climate change were the two big things that had come together to cause this. Then on the 7th of February, two big things happened. One of them was that the first of the doctors died. And at the same time, China ran out of shipping containers. 
So this ability to use weak signals and put them together, that was the moment that many people in the New Zealand meat industry knew that it was time to start to change the dynamics of where we moved our product and how. And I tell you this because I think that this level of detail is happening across um, in a number of probably government agencies and also in the private sector, but we're not sharing it as much as we probably should with each other. Um, I've just done a piece of work for Mokotangata, which is the Workforce Development Council for the primary sector, you know, food and fibre sector, and we ran 15 community workshops to identify four possible futures for the food and fibre sector. And I, I think this was a really useful piece of work because in the past we tend to have had an agency or agencies in the sector that have come up with one future. And then we try and build a, a, a government strategy towards one future. But if we can think about there being multiple futures out there, we can start to think about what strategies will work in different ways. So what if we have more Māori ownership and a more Māori workforce in food and fibre? What if we have a more foreign ownership and more foreign workforce in food and fibre? What if we, if we delay uh, climate change regulations and, um, and we stay with a, a product commodity kind of strategy? Or what if we had strong environmental regulation and we went for a premium strategy? Each of those futures will play out differently. And the real future may be more like the centre with a piece of each of them. But if we can play with these possible futures, we have the ability to develop regulation and to develop policies that will work into different futures rather than just picking one linear future that we think will emerge and that we're generally not that good at predicting. So I want to just leave you with this last idea, which is that if you look back 10 years and even 20 um, and try to explain what 2020 was like, we don't have the language to explain it to someone from 20 years ago. So if I explain to someone from 20 years ago that I, I had cocktail parties on Zoom for a year and that I Zoom bombed my dad's retirement party, it, it just doesn't make any sense that uh, the Māori Language Commission would be putting out zooey backgrounds. Um, it wasn't a word that we used, that I needed to take photos of my food with my phone and I needed to share it with strangers that I didn't know. doesn't make sense. Um, selfies were something that, you know, dad put a, a camera on a rock and you all tried to rush together and get into the shot. Um, it wasn't something that you could do on a phone that you could hold. And um, the jib crisis kind of didn't make sense. Nobody thought that we'd be listening to Radio New Zealand at one o'clock uh, for two years or something to find out how many New Zealanders had died. And I didn't expect uh, to be going to work in my jammies and just looking great from the, the waist up. To be fair, I'm fully dressed, just make that clear. Um, but, you know, these, these kinds of, any of this doesn't make sense to someone from 2002. And I think that's important because what happens is these changes happen slowly, 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 and then suddenly. And, um, and yet our regulatory environments take a very long time to change and we're slow to anticipate. That isn't because government is bad. I want to be super clear at this. Humans in general are bad at this. Um, we, we get used to what is around us and we don't notice that the world is changing. So I would encourage you to think that in 20 years time, we won't have the language to describe what it is that we're doing. And so what we need to be thinking about now is how do we deal with emergent issues faster? How do we think about using these scenarios in the way that we develop regulation? And uh, how do we really take those future generations into account and so this diagram um, I really love where you can think about that little grey bubble being the people who have been born but are now dead. The little green bubble is uh, us alive at the moment. And then that big orange bubble is our future unborn generations and they way outnumber us. And yet what happens is we mostly think and design for today, not for them. So, um, you know, we can think about this kind of really building for long term. I just want to get to my last slide before I run out of time, which is really like, how do we have a conversation with our citizens about what the role of government is? Not just a discussion about market failure, not just a discussion about guardianship, but what is it that our citizens really want from government and how do we provide for that? Um, if we look at the countries that do this well, many of them have high tax regimes, they have good social cohesion. How do we really think about that? 
what is the nature of regulation in a volatile, uncertain, um, ambiguous, you know, changing world? Um, how do we take these very long-term views? And then before I knew that, um, you know, we were going to have such expertise from Bill and Lil this morning, I really want us to think about what a bicultural framework might look like. And we don't have a map to follow here. So it is really for us to create this map ourselves. But what if we really recognise the mana of Papatunu and Langinui and everything that we did? Um, what if we really thought about how we fuck a papa to all creation? Um, increasingly, I'm working with CRIs, and those CRIs know that matauranga is science, and we're no longer talking about matauranga and science. Um, the modi and the interconnectedness of all things. What if we really thought about those future generations? So I started by saying that it was five generations back in my family when we first got the climate science that said that we knew that we were damaging our environment um, and our atmosphere. So we can't leave that five more. Um, and then I just want to leave you with this idea of really thinking with systems. So kia ora piri, I can see that I'm out of time and luckily that is my last slide. So um, kia pai tira, kia ora mai tato. And Melissa, thank you very, very much indeed. That's absolutely absolutely phenomenal. There is so much in there. Um, we are fairly tight on time, but we, we would be robbing ourselves if we didn't avail ourselves of the chance to uh, ask some questions. Anyone want to ask me in an analog fashion, Mick Jagger style in the microphone or pop it through on the app really quickly? Melissa, while they're thinking about that, just one from me. Um, we're, we're, we're sort of previewing um, the use of data. Um, where does that fit into, if you like, the cosmology of what you put forward in terms of, you know, postulating alternative futures, almost a sort of multiverse point, if I could put it like that? Yeah. Um, so one of the things I really like is um, if you create those scenarios, like say we did there for Mokotangata, mm. we ended up with four very different scenarios. Um, and we created them with farmers, with unions, with Komato and Marae, with Rangatahi. Um, and out of those, what you can start to do is to track the weak signals as they emerge and see which are starting to become more likely. So let's say we had a a scenario in which we have more Māori ownership and more Māori workforce, well, we could track treaty claim data and we could see where is that investment money going and are we seeing an increase in people coming home? Are we seeing an increase in public hiring and housing? Um, you know, the gig economy in some ways could play very well for Papakaunga because you could come home and work in the hops in half the year and seafood in half the year. You may still have a gig economy, but you've got a full year of employment at home. So we might track the data differently, um, depending on which scenario we have. Or if we're thinking about that one where there is more, more foreign ownership and, and more immigrant workforce, how do we track the data points that start to see if that's emerging? And, and then as these futures emerge, we can start to build policy um, around them. But we've already anticipated that these four different ways the future might turn out could already be, you know, could be emerging. And that's going to be something that sense. I'm going to, yeah, it makes sense to me. And, and I think it will make sense to our next panel that I'm going to sort of wire this into. But before I do that, anybody else? Anyone? Anyone? Going, going, gone. Big hand again for Melissa. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Have a great day.